everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Cinephiles Live here on The Cinephiles YouTube channel. I am one of your co-hosts. I'm the outlaw, John Roca, joined as always by my brother and The Cinephiles and my brother in life, Steve Morris. How are you, man? I'm very good. I just got back from a vacation in the Pacific Northwest where mm-hmm. I was in the San Juan Islands, where I've never been before. That is absolutely beautiful. Wow. I ate lots of seafood and oysters and tooled around in the trees and went whale watching and all sorts of fun stuff wow sounds like a perfect way to spend your summer hanging out summer yes having some nice food going whale watching maybe riding the whales if you feel like it on their fins or something i'm sure people do that (laughs) sure sure that's what i did (laughs) so i went aquaman style on a couple of orcas you know i like it i like it it's better going the deep style uh (laughs) as we see in the boys which is no good uh but yeah i mean I did eat some octopus. I don't know oh. if that <laughs> counts. Scarring, scarring scene for sure. But we are here to talk <laughs> about summer movies. That's our focus today. Thanks to so many people who are joining us live already right off the bat. Uh, we're having fun. Happy Father's Day to everybody. Happy Father's Day, Steve. And, Thank you. Um, and happy Father's and Daddy's Day to anybody who's also a daddy. Uh, and a father so just giving some shouts out to everybody here is, and thank you so much for joining us this evening uh as we talk about this and it you know we kind of came up with this idea to talk about summer movies because memorial day was just it just happened and uh, tom cruise's top gun maverick is soaring towards a billion dollars which is insane to even consider and i'm so happy i think both of us are happy to see it because we we enjoyed the film and it's like okay well what does this mean that summer movies are kind of back after the last two years of COVID and what have you. Are we back on track for summer movies? So we're going to talk about the state of summer movies now, how summer movies kind of became a thing, and then talk about the ones we're looking forward to this year and where we see summer movies going in the future. Um, And, of course, our Streamlabs and Super Chats are open. I will put the uh, Super Chat – or sorry, the Streamlab – address in the chat here i'll pin it in the chat so you all can send in your questions your thoughts your comments about summer movie season but steve and we steve we'll begin with you i mean when you hear the term summer movie talk to me about what comes to mind but also how you personally define a summer movie well it, it's funny like for me it i think the idea i was you know you know me i'm gonna go through and look at some history and try sure, to do sure. some research and see if i can come up with some definitive answers about these things and and the big thing i came up with was what we think of as the summer movie yeah it really started when i started thinking of the summer movie you know what i mean like like my high school which is the mid 80s yeah is that's when i first started going like okay school's out and i had the ability to go choose to see a movie by myself and that's where the the modern summer movie began of course it really begins in 70 five with uh or 76 with jaws right and then 77 with star wars but it's you know so funny because i was looking through all the the history and man back in the early 70s there was no summer movie the way we think of it no it it didn't like i like i'll just read this one because i went through because i looked at a lot of summers here's the summer movies for 1971 go ahead clute yes carnal knowledge Mm. omega man willy wonka and shaft Interesting combination of films. The the, the uh, you know in the next year we've got the candidate and Boxcar Bertha and Deliverance is a summer yeah. movie. You know yeah. you know it's like the idea that the summer was going to be the specific kind of movie that starts in the mid eighties really with with the sort of the idea of okay schools out big blockbuster time. You know well I mean really it starts in the night in early nineteen eighties because if you look at it Empire Strikes Back is around that time. Yep. Raiders of the Lost Ark is around that time. Yep. That's when it starts to become a thing that's starting to be kind exactly. of E.T. is a summer movie as well. So Spielberg, you could argue, ruling summer movies at the onset of summer movies and understanding how to make a movie that was uh, pe- that appealed to the mainstream, but it also challenged you a little bit, but made a lot of money because it was still available for kids. And that's the definitions that I have found uh, when I'm looking through summer movies is, PG-13, so enough people can go see it, um, and also or PG, and also um, fun, also interesting, slightly challenging, could be sci-fi, could be action, adventure, could be drama even, depending on the kind of drama and what have you. So it isn't just this idea that it, it, the um, stereotype is this idea is a dumb action movie is a summer movie. Right. 
Not always. There's there have been other movies that have come out during the summers and made a lot of money. And we've seen the progression, as Steve said, from Star Wars and Jaws into, as I just mentioned here, Empire Strikes Back, Indiana Jones, into Jurassic Park, uh, Matrix challenging it in terms of when it was released. Then, boom, the Marvel movies have really kind yeah. of owned a lot of the summer movie season. So we've seen it metamorphosize or evolve the term summer movie to encapsulate much more than what you would typically think of a summer movie. Well, and I think the big difference is that pre-Jaws and Star Wars, Hollywood dis- thought that grown-ups were who's going to drive movie sales. Right. So people above their 20s. And so there was a wide variety of films that they put out in the summer. And then post Jaws and Star Wars, they went, oh no, it's teenagers and kids is where we're going to make most of our money. Those are the people that are going to see movies over and over again. That's where we're going to sell all of our merchandise. And so let's start as soon as school's out, we're going to start marketing to them. And that's how everything shifts for good and for bad. You know, I mean, there's a lot of good. I mean, I'm sure you had the experience of, I can't wait for blank yeah. you know movie top gun yeah top yeah blank, that's yeah. well yeah. top gun is a perfect example but yeah. you know it's funny i i, I just want to because you mentioned top gun at the beginning yeah. i have a real it's funny as i was looking through these lists of movies every year by the time you get to the 2000s and mid 2010s and yeah. it's all sequels and ip from right. other era you know what i mean like it's yeah. like nine out of ten of the top grossing movies are sequels or part of a part of a property you know what i mean yeah and that's too bad for some reason and it doesn't make any sense yeah i don't put top gun maverick in that category of course it is a sequel right but But it feels like a real movie in a way that's its own thing do you know what i mean yeah i absolutely agree with you i think top gun is a separate film top gun maverick is a separate film i agree it doesn't feel like a sequel because of all this these years that have passed now Are there things that, uh, you know, is it very much connected to the original film? Yes, but it feels spiritually like a completely different film. You could argue it feels like a mature blockbuster film in the way that mature blockbuster films used to feel back in the day. That's what it is. It's not just, yeah, are the action scenes great in the sky? Sure, but what anchors the film is this emotional relationship with uh, Penny Benjamin and really the emotional relationship between him and Rooster and a man looking back on his life. That's not your standard summer movie. It's, you know, be more about him, like, you know, riding on top of the jet somehow, you know, that would be what you'd expect. But what you see in the film is a much more reflective, contemplative uh, maverick that really has knocked audiences socks off mixed in with some great action sequences, some intense moments, some funny uh, moments, some really sweet, tender moments uh, between Penny Benjamin and Maverick. So there's the film has so much. And I wonder, Steve, it's so funny you, you kind of tapped on this. I wonder if we are seeing a nu- the next evolution of summer blockbuster movies. And I'm kind of jumping the gun here in the topic order, but uh, with Top Gun Maverick, because it feels like this was a sign to the studios. This can work. This approach can work, you know, adult themes mixed in with fun moments, mixed in with real stuff, mixed in with uh, um, uh, with these great action sequences. And at the end, audiences are left satisfied and and it's almost going to make a billion dollars, which nobody could have predicted when this was first released. I. I'm I, I can't believe I'm saying this and this could sound really weird yeah. coming out of my mouth, but it it's like the sequel to Top Gun yeah. is a mature, sensitive, complex adult movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like here's this movie that was for you know, as as populist as you could possibly imagine in 1986, yeah. as yeah. testosterone filled, and I know you love it. I'm not I disparaging the film, except I disparage it a little bit because I don't love it. The more, the older I get, the cheesier it becomes. And then yeah. I go see Maverick and go, no, this is actually the sequel to Top Gun is a film for grownups. <laughs> it's really, really bizarre to me. And yet I think that's true. Yeah. On so, not that not that a teenager is not going to enjoy it, and maybe enlistment in the Navy, you know, pilots will will go up just like it did in '86. But it still yeah. feels like a you know. I, I think what it is is that. So many of the sequels are the same but different is we want to capture the same thing and we don't want to necessarily go too deep. We don't want to necessarily be challenging in any way. Right. And even though Maverick certainly delivers on those flight sequences, they're unbelievable. Yes. And yet it does have real depth to it, I think. 
you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and that's the thing that I wonder, and we'll, we'll address that a little bit later on in the show, Steve. We should put a pin on that and certainly come back to addressing what we think the future of summer blockbuster movies might be. Um, but one thing to think about, summer, the term blockbuster has been around since around 1948. So mm. summers did not, summer movies did not kind of inspire or coin the term blockbuster. Hollywood has had the blockbuster t- title for a film or descript- description for a film since 1948. It was just, and I think this is what happens, Steve, organically as we progress uh, as human beings, right? You talk about the fact that we saw this demographic that the studios all of a sudden shifted to cater to when the summer movies, summer movies kind of became huge off of Jaws and off of uh, uh, Star Wars. That's also what started to be the demographic that everyone started to change their approach to grabbing. They wanted to grab the attention of the, that age demographic so that they could spend the money on their products, TV, candy, movies, uh, um, comic books, all kinds of stuff were ch- like the 1980s is a great example of a complete sea change in yeah. where companies felt they were going to target their marketing when it came to um, demographics. And we saw more kids in commercials. We saw more, more of this like Coke, uh, Pepsi, these kinds of things becoming cool for teenagers to talk about or to be involved in, in commercials. You, you know, what just occurred to me. That's Sorry. weird. Is I, is I can, I can see like the odds are back in the early eighties, mid eighties mm-hmm. that a 45, 50 year old dude is not going to buy the t-shirt. And right. so Hollywood is going to market to the young people because they are going to buy the t-shirts and yeah. the other merchandise. And then I suddenly went, and then we who were teenagers then grew up and our 50 year old asses will buy the t-shirts <laughs> you know like we've been trained yeah. from our youth to still be the consumers that we were then yeah. and still cuz we're the ones lining up for the marvel movies it's we're not eternally just, young that's yeah. what they taught us to be eternally <laughs> young steve yes look at me i i am eternally young <laughs> I wear my Blade Runner shirt right now. Eternally young. That's what I'm saying. But let's let's hit some of these other blockbuster movies, Steve, and get the conversation Absolutely. going here. Let's hit the 80s, right? You have E.T., the, uh, the extraterrestrial. You have Tron, um, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, one of our favorite films and one of our favorite episodes of The Cinephiles. The Secret of Nim, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Ghostbusters 2, and, uh, and, and a film that a lot of our... Uh, fans on Twitter tweeted about uh, to us Batman 1989's Batman that is also a summer a blockbuster or summer movie there in the 1980s so uh, pretty you know pretty good uh, basket of movies there to choose from and that's just around the top there's much more that you can look at from the 1980s well let's let's start with 89 Batman because sure. to me that's just like a sea change for yeah. me, part of it so 89, I'm literally working in a comic book store. Yeah. I remember seeing the trailer for uh, that movie. And oh, yeah. the moment that the, you know, that it went up in front of the moon and you had that essentially bat symbol against the moon and you heard that music and you yeah. heard Michael Keaton go, I'm Batman. <laughs> like that. I, we went to the movie to see the trailer again. Yeah. Like, that's how excited all of my friends were. And we lined up at midnight and saw that movie. And that is such a, like, movies are for us now. Like, that was such a huge, huge moment. And now my feelings about that film have changed over the years. And and even then, I didn't 100% love it. I actually haven't seen it in a really long time, by the way. But that was a big deal when Batman came out in the theaters. Yeah, it was. It was massive. I, I went to see it like seven or eight times. Die Hard, I saw seven or eight times. There were certain films I'd reserve for multiple viewings, and Batman was one of them. Absolutely. I'd see it in the afternoon. I'd see it at night. I'd see it at the first showing. It was just something about this signaling, hey, all of you who've been to co- into comics, we got it right, at least for yeah. 1989. We got it right. We respect it. We love it. That movie is considered dark in 1989. And, yeah. you know, and the sequel even darker, uh, as supposedly, uh, which is kind of hard to think about when you look back on these films now, but those were dark. And so there was a celebration. There was almost a feeling like, okay, they get it. They understand that I'm an important part of their demographic and I'm going to go see this movie multiple times to thank them 
almost instinctively, even subconsciously, to thank them for making a movie like this yes. that I can enjoy in the theater. You know? Well, it, it's funny. I mean, it's it's so hard to think of and remember with yeah. the world today. The world today is dominated by superhero movies yes. in which the most the smallest and most random characters have their own TV shows and movies, you know, like yeah. the fact that there's guardians of the galaxies movies and moon Knight TV shows and, you know, yeah. Scarlet witch. Like, that's Marvel nuts. now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's insane that those things are happening. But in the eighties, it's like what we had was Christopher Reeve, Superman, which yes. we loved. Yes. And then you had a couple of bad, you know, you know, you had the not bad. You had the wonder woman TV show. You had the incredible Hulk TV right. show. Right. The memory of Batman's Adam West. You know, yes, that's right. what Batman is for everybody. Yep. And then a bunch of us, you and me included, yep. found the Dark Knight Returns and yep. Batman Year One. And yeah. and suddenly this idea of who Batman was had transformed for a, a very small group of super passionate people. Yeah. You know, because comic books were not then what they are today. Absolutely. And so we all love them. And so when just the design of that movie and the fact that it was comparatively dark compared to Adam West. Yeah. Yeah. Like we had discovered this amazing thing and the world had said, yeah, OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's make it. Let's do it. Um, yeah. Return of the Jedi is a summer movie in 1983 as well. Ghostbusters in 84 um uh, temple of doom you can i you know it may not like that movie but certainly it made 167 million dollars beverly hills cop 2 was a i remember going to see that in the summer with yeah. my family i remember going to see that with my parents and having a good time rambo first blood part 2 is a summer movie as well gremlins is a summer movie back to the future is a summer movie so so many lethal weapon 2 which i watched it about an hour of again last night on uh, TCM or no what, AMC. I mean, like those films, wh um, uh, whatever, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Those are a, a bunch of 1980s films as well that were considered great summer blockbuster movies. So getting a nice taste, right? We're getting experimental stuff. We're getting, as you said, sequels. We're also getting launches of new franchises, films that explore new horrors like Gremlins, things of that nature. So there was so much here for us. It was like a smorgasbord in the 1980s to of 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 fun summer movies to enjoy there during that decade. I'd love to hit on just a couple of the movies you yeah. mentioned. The first one being Return of the Jedi. So yes. I shockingly was a rule obeyer as a student. <laughs> I I think I cut class twice in my entire time at high school. Right. One of them was to go see Jedi. Yeah, I cut the whole day of school. I went to the Cinema One in uh, Larkspur mm -hmm. or Corner Madera. I lined up, and it was—I'm sure you had this. I lined up at eleven or whatever time was for the first oh, yeah. movie. Yeah. Three movies went by before I got into the theater. Yeah. So I sat in line for six hours, slowly but surely making my way towards the front until yeah. I could finally see Return of the Jedi in the theater, and it was one of the great movie experiences ever like do i again do i love that movie quite as much as i did when it came out no but did i was i absolutely blown away would i have lined up again to watch it a second time that day totally yeah yeah what what's what's the ones that you remember lining up for sir uh well certainly um a top gun raiders of, uh, uh what's it the last crusade i remember lining yeah. up for last crusade for sure um what was the one? Oh, oh um return of the jedi I definitely lined up empire strikes back with my dad i remember uh. us lining up outside springfield mall which which uh has it does no it no longer exists anymore i found out a couple of years ago we stood out and we stand lining up against the brick wall of the mall outside in the summer all the way down and your father the whole time saying this movie better be worth this movie this i mean <laughs> you know cuz my dad didn't you know it, it, to him lining up for a movie was a weird concept because he's a you know he's from bolivia so for him it was really strange for me i was like everyone else the kids are this is we got to see this you know there was this kind of pressure to kind of see these movies you know and and, and this is before you know y'all who are young y'all don't understand like you couldn't just buy the ticket ahead of time there well there wasn't you had to line up concerts you had to line up some you had to show up at three or four in the morning outside the arena to line up just to get a shot at getting a ticket or getting a good seat in the concert auditorium. So these are the things that we did back in the 1980s to show our dedication. And it was 
just like kind of accepted that that's what you did, you know, and showed your dedication and you got to meet people in line, make friends mm -hmm. with people in line, have these fun conversations, sharing your nerddom. And you might argue, Steve, that nerddom spread because of this ability to stay in the line and discover that there are other people who felt this way about your movie or your franchise like you did. And so you could, you know, create a kind of community in essence uh, about uh, surrounding this uh, franchise. So there are a million reasons, not a million reasons. There are many reasons why I think that we are way better off today where you buy your ticket in advance, you have your assigned seat yeah. and you show up and you go sit in your seat. That is a better system. But Absolutely. I totally agree with you that something was lost. Yeah. Because you're, you're, it's just as you said, you're in line with all these people. It's a communal experience. You're all excited about the movie. People, yeah. you know, messages would go back and forth. People would start to make jokes and yell. And, you know, you would yeah. get to know the people that you were in. Of course, the bad part was when you finally got in and you were the last people in and you and your friend had to split seats between one person at the front right corner right. and the other person at the front left corner in the worst spot. I remember seeing movies where it's just, you know, you're in this seat where you're yeah. just <laughs> desperately trying to not hurt your neck the whole time but that that's, was part of the thing that's another part of this steve is, is so correct to bring this up we didn't have assigned seating so if you got a ticket you had to run into that theater and hope hoping you grabbed a good seat and like steve said if you were the last ones in there good luck you're probably mo mostly sitting in the front or way in the back in an uncomfortable seat and that's the price you had to pay just to get in there and see that. And the other part of this, Steve, that you mentioned, you know, the bad part of it splitting up. The other bad part is if you were waiting through two or three showings, you had to make sure you covered your ears when people walked out oh, of the yeah. theater because people would reveal spoilers. People would reveal uh, things that were going to happen in the movie sometimes excitedly talking about the film. You know, nerds are not necessarily known for modifying their voices so is it, or modulating their voices. So uh, they would come out excitedly screaming about a film that you were just about to go in and see. So you had to kind of figure out uh, when to do that and be aware of that when the doors open that you were covering your ears all the way up until you got inside the auditorium. So yeah, it was great. We didn't have internet. We didn't have any of that stuff. So, yeah. you know, the best you got was, uh, no, not even, not even cell phones. We couldn't even call each other to tell each other what was going on in terms of the movie. So it was that kind of experience, you know? Well, it, it, and like in pre preparation for the show, I could go on the internet and say, what are the summer movies coming out this year? And there right. is a schedule of everything that's coming out. Plus I have Twitter and I have my good friend, the outlaw and the geek buddies who are telling me trailers, 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 <laughs> and which trailers are coming out. So I am well informed about what is coming my way. Yeah. When I was 13, I didn't know, like, unless you bought, you know, Entertainment Weekly or something, yeah. I, who knew what was coming up? It wasn't until you saw the commercial on TV or you happened to catch the trailer when you were seeing a movie that you would find out a movie was coming and then it would spread by word of mouth. And then, of course, because we didn't have cell phones in the Internet, is you had to call your friend on a landline and say, hey, do you want to meet me to go see this movie? And then you would just line up and hope yes. for the best. Yes, I, yeah, I, I, I lined up for many films as a teen, as a 14, 15 year old teen. We didn't have the fear now that people have nowadays. We just go show up in the theater and stand there in line waiting for it. Our parents had just anticipated or expected us to come home whenever we were done. You know, that was the yeah. game. And you were, you know, especially if you had a job at 15 years old, you got that driver's permit. Ooh, you got to use your parents' car to go to the theater um, and, and see if you, or you took the bus. Or you walked, or you took your bike and locked it up and hoped it was there after the movie was done. These are the games that we played back then. But there was, a, as you said, Steve, there was a, there was something that there's something that we've lost because there was a quaintness to that. There's a, there's a fondness and nostalgia in that that we've kind of lost now. And I think we still keep trying to find in these online message boards and these online chat rooms, YouTube in the comments section. It's essentially a search for community, either a hating it or loving it it's a search for community in discussions about a particular uh, movie or tv show um or piece of media which i think is so fa uh, fantastic you know um, I, I think it is definitely good and bad yes. i think you know those communities are because i think there's so much you didn't get rewarded for hating on a movie no. in 1985 the way you could get rewarded for hating on a movie today that's you a know good what point. i mean yeah, people yeah. were people i think people were you know, like if you hated the movie, you would hate it privately and with a couple of friends. You didn't right. go online and spew some venom. Yeah. Um, 
the 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 other thing I was thinking about is like I am exactly at the age where I witnessed the introduction of the multiplex. Yes. Like when I was a young kid, yeah. all the movie theaters, they just had one screen, yes. almost all of them. And then slowly but surely, first there was, you know, a four screen one and then a six screen one. And then you get to the 17 screen, whatever. Right. Did you ever do, and, you know, I, I believe the statute of limitations is up on this, <laughs> uh, the show up at the multiplex in the morning and maybe see more movies than you actually purchased ticket for. Oh yeah, absolutely. When you're poor, that's what you do. I, and I was, I grew up, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, so I, I would show up for one movie and you know, I'm a teenager. I don't know how this, all this stuff works. And then you try to slyly sleek into one and you could, because there wasn't assigned seating. So yep. you could slide in there. You hope the usher didn't see you or didn't notice you or hadn't seen you in the other theater and you try, I tried to knock out three to four movies every time I did that, you know, and, and it was, I did that all the way up until, I don't know, my twenties. Uh, I remember doing it in my twenties one time. And I remember that day after I walked out of the third movie, walking to my car going like, I can't do this anymore. This feels like a young man's thing to do. So it, that was the day it stopped. But yeah, when I was a teenager, yeah, absolutely. Every once in a while, if you want to see multiple movies or if you wanted to see them again, you know, because you do the logic in your mind. I'd already paid to see the movie, so I'm re-watching it. Why should I have to pay to re-watch it? I'm just going to go enjoy it again. And so that's how you would slide in and see movie multiple times. Yeah, for sure. Well, and then there was the other thing, like you're watching a movie and you're not really digging on the movie that much. And you're in a multiplex where the walls are not that thick. And yes. you can hear the explosions yeah, the that make you know that like, oh, it's just at the climax of Die Hard. I'm just going to slowly move away <laughs> and like, head over to the other one to see the end of a great movie. Yeah. I never did that. I never, <laughs> I never did that. Yeah, there's still something great. Like when I go see screenings now at the bigger multiplexes, there's something great about walking through the hallway and hearing the different snippets from the different theaters and seeing if you can pick out the scene as you're walking by. It's a nice little game I play myself when I can actually hear the movie through the door. Wonder, okay, what's the, oh, that's right, that's that scene, blah, blah, blah. So it's a nice little way to kind of touch back in uh, with those movies. Um, let's see if we got any Streamlabs or Super Chats. Yeah, uh, JMB donated one here. He said... Uh, Steve Roca, if you guys were to make a Star Trek summer movie, holy shit, what would be its central plot slash theme? Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, is it original series, next generation? Like what? I, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Like clearly, yeah. Go ahead, my man. So here, here, here are some. I, I come up with multiple movies. Like for instance, mm. if I, I remember back when it was time for next generation movies, I wanted to see a movie in which. Riker and Worf were separated from the Enterprise and they had to take over and uh, defeat another ship in order to go save the Enterprise. That was that was that was my next generation idea. Um, I want I know the Star Trek series. If someone in Paramount said, hey, we need another yet another Star Trek series. I know <laughs> the Star Trek series I want to create, yeah. <laughs> which is which is I always want to do a series that's like the weird thing that you they want did, to give this idea away do you sure or, uh, sure okay, if, if, right. sure if, you know Just of course sure. i listen i don't have any any uh belief that paramount is going to come mr morris <laughs> we understand you have some ideas we'd like you to come and, and make more uh tv for us um they did this weird thing where they did prequels with discovery and strange new worlds where they ended yeah. up being more technologically advanced than yes. the original series which is weird yeah. is I wanted to do a do Star Trek Explorer that's the name and mm -hmm. that it is the 10 crew tiny tiny early warp vessel ship out oh. in the middle of nowhere yeah it's just 10 people on a falling apart beaten up bare bones technology ship traveling out and exploring I like that that that's is good the, the Star Trek series I'd want to do. That seems like a good budget conscious one too that would get approved. I feel like green lighted because there's not going to be that much of a budget on it. I like that idea. Um, Doug developer says, I like to know what happens when you guys missed a movie in theaters back in the 1980s. And when there was no home video, Oh man, when it's out of theaters, how long do you have to wait to see it on your TV? Which film do you remember? were in theaters the longest. Yeah. That's a great question, Doug. Um, yeah, Steve, do you want to, do you want to, do you remember any of this? Do you want to chime in on this? Well, I've got a few thoughts the, myself, but please go ahead. The, the, the first thing is, is we didn't know there, there was no alternative. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, so we didn't wasn't. go, 
I mean, it's like you didn't see it in the theater. You didn't see it in the theater, you know. Yep. And so, and then you would, yes, you would wait until it was on TV. I got Showtime, I think, in '81, maybe. Mm. Mm. And so that was the. And I remember. Do you? I don't know if you had Showtime or HBO, but the little no, HBO. Yeah. yeah the, remember when the little booklet would come each month yes. and it would have the schedule, and every month you get that booklet and you go, "What's on? What did I get?" Yeah. And then it was, and I would watch those movies over and over again. They were you know. Great. Yeah, like yeah. I um and then there was yes there was you would wait until they came on TV. I remember when Superman came on TV. I remember when yeah uh, motion Star Trek motion picture came on TV. I remember those things. Yes. Um. What What about you? Do you remember? Like, can you remember? Like, what ones do you remember watching on TV? Oh yeah, I mean, like for me, the first Star Wars movie. I did not see that in the theater. I saw that on television on the CBS Sunday night at the movies. Uh, that was, I remember that was a huge deal. I remember crying when Obi-Wan was killed. Uh, and I, my parents were like, what the hell is going on with you? And you know, just, you're just so caught up. And I remember the Rocky movies. Oh, I yeah. didn't see a Rocky movie until uh, Rocky three. I didn't see a Rocky movie in the theater until 1983 when Rocky three came out. But the first two movies I saw on VHS or on beta or on TV. So those were the things and I had, we had a beta machine. That's how far back we go. We had a beta machine uh, that we would, we had some movies that we had and watched them religiously, but then every once in a while, you know, you'd have to go out and, and you'd have to, sorry, you'd have to wait to see it on TV. And uh, Steve's right. Those HBO booklets came, they were this thick. They had the synopsis of all the movies mm -hmm. in the back and then you, or in the front, and then you'd kind of circle the date and the time of the movie and you put and you check the book every day to make sure you're not missing it all this kind of stuff and so before vhs's you had to be there it was appointment television to watch the movies and what have you because then you wouldn't see them again for like a month or two months that's yeah. the thing and with, and with movies in the theater if you missed it during its run you had to wait until they re-released it which was never a guarantee you had to wait till they re-released it um, but of course, movies also ran longer back then, as Doug alluded to. Um, I can't remember, like some movies, I think Star Wars ran for a year. And I think uh, oh, yeah. so did Jaws. So you had certain movies that were just there year round because people wanted to come back and see it again. But also people were still discovering it uh, as it went along. Because remember, it was for the first night thing is a relatively new concept in the world of film. The opening weekend. That's a relatively new concept just from the last three to four decades uh, in film. Yeah, because it used to be that they would open a movie uh, in a narrow release. So it would be yes. in New York and L.A. and Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then they would see how it does. And depending on how it did, they roll it out to more, more theaters. And it really is Jaws. Yeah. Jaws is the movie that they went, we're going to open this. I think it was like 700 theaters, yes. which at the time was huge and insane that they would yeah. open it at all those places at once. But since that point, that's when the opening weekend thing starts. Exactly. Um, the, the other thing, too, I think it really depends on where you where you were, because mm -hmm. so I grew up in Mern County, which is, you know, the suburbs across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. So right. there are only particularly when I was a kid, there were only a few theaters. You know, right. it's not like there was a ton of movie theaters. Yeah. So not everything played there. Now, of course, I could go across the bay to San Francisco, where which is a city. But yeah. if you grew up, you know, in a small town somewhere, a lot of those movies, they never made it to your you know what i mean like you weren't seeing the small independent films or the foreign films and yeah they just weren't there if you had one movie theater or two movie theaters in your town that was it you know yeah, yeah. you were stuck with that situation right and this is let's let's uh, show you all an example this is what uh this hbo oh this is what it would look like see so you'd have the contents the table of contents it would tell you then the page number uh that you go to and then it would have the synopsis as you can see there of the film and then you'd see all the days and times, Thursday, August 1st, August 2nd, August 3rd, and you'd go through it all and it would just be repeated and there'd be some ads uh, in it as well. The boxing stuff, right? The sports stuff would get highlighted as well. So you saw, so this is a great example, Oxford Blue, Streets of Fire, Woman in Red. This is what we had to rely on. As oh my God. Guide. Right, Steve? Look at this. There's so much. Okay, so first of all, we had Revenge of the Nerds, yes, which Revenge I also Nerds. remember lining up for. That yes. was an amazingly great movie for me at the time and looking at it there's some ooh, very uncomfortable <laughs> things sure. in there we just had a page with back to school with yes. danger field and sam kennison was in there yes. dreamscape with dennis yes. quaid i completely forgot about that movie i so remember seeing in the theater it had the 
warriors come <laughs> out and play a guy yeah i mean it's so and, right. and this was this would show up and i would look at this not having the, a whole ton of friends or a lot of social life yeah and i would map out my month exactly this is you what know? you did this is what you did first and ten was essentially playmakers before we got playmakers on espn there's cloak and dagger and look and there's the teen scene the summer teen scene oh. and these are kind of like these are kind of films that they recommend for you to watch if you want to watch them but so a lot of these films uh, you're probably never going to remember hockey night the grand baby unforgivable Girl secret there is uh, a revenge of uh, there oh, sorry there's my father my rival uh there's so these are films that you're like what what is this all about then you'd have the daytime stuff romantic comedy that you could that's for the parents there to figure out what they want to watch and then they would tease certain films that were coming right things that were september terminator is coming coming yes. soon uh, phil collins olivia newton john right these are the tightrope the heavyweight the uh, larry holmes versus michael spinks these are the things that you would uh be aware of you know going forward oh wow I don't even remember got, Mussolini yeah. with Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> and there's uh, in, in this, honestly, John, I pictured now a whole series of live shows where all it is is you and I looking at old <laughs> HBO <laughs> schedules because we got Gandhi in here. Yes. Uh, uh, we got uh, the seven magnificent gladiators. Well, yeah. It's, it, there was some weird, there's some weird stuff in here that I don't remember us having or seeing. Um, so it's kind of funny to look at this now. Um, but I, yeah, here we go. Here we go. I was going to turn. I was trying to move it over. Yeah, Eddie Macon's Run. I remember that. Dog Day Afternoon. Brian's Song. Uh, Pope of Greenwich well, Village. Look at these films. Well, and this also goes to. I know we've something we talked about before, but yeah. we live in the world where, where every, whatever you want to watch, you can watch. Yeah, right. It is. That you know. Works. You know. Assuming it's out of the theater for a few months, it is available. It might cost you a couple bucks, but it exists. Where for us, it was this is what's on yeah you know yeah. and so it forced us to watch a bunch of things that we probably wouldn't have chosen to watch yeah but i actually think in this weird way we got a better education because we were forced to watch weird shit you yeah. know what i mean Absolutely. like i would never have watched i wouldn't have chosen to watch mr ed right. or every episode <laughs> of i love lucy even though i love lucy is a great show yeah. or the bowery boys or old shirley temple movies or laurel and hardy or all the like but that was what was on and yeah. so that is what i watched Absolutely. and with hbo and of course we i think we do have to pay a moment's respect to whether it was hbo or showtime there were these other movies that came on maybe after 11 o'clock. Well, those night. weren't summer movies, so I don't know <laughs> why we need to bring those up. That's okay. true, right? You know what? They, I mean, listen, for those movies, it was always summer. <laughs> it was always summer. That's for damn sure. So, yeah. And summer is usually hot and sweaty, so that's usually what Oh, boy. Uh, let's Hello. start the 1990s summer movies to move into another area here. Ghost came out in July of 1990. Mm. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Total Recall. Uh, Terminator 2 was a July 3rd, and that started to become a thing too, Steve, in the 1990s, is July 4th being the right. weekend to drop the big summer movies, right? Batman Returns is in June of 92, then Jurassic Park on June 11th of 93, The Fugitive, uh, an adult approach to a summer movie, True Lies in 94, Apollo 13, again, another adult approach. Uh, to that Independence Day in 1996, being on the nose, being released on July 3rd. Twister was another one. Men in Black, which a number of people have tweeted us about as well. Mulan in 1998 was a summer movie. And a film that we have covered on the Cinephiles, Armageddon, son, July 1st of 1998. Blade was 98. Phantom Menace was 99. Uh, the South Park as well, June of 1999. The Blair Witch Project was July of 1999 and The Sixth Sense in August of 1999. So an incredibly eclectic group of movies as quote unquote summer movies, Steve. So this idea that it's only just action oriented, dumb, shoot them up movies is completely ridiculous. When you just look at the 90s decade alone, there are a lot of thought provoking, interesting, innovative, new kinds of films that kind of that um, elevate the genre that they're from. So it's just an incredible encapsulation of the artistry that was going on in the 1990s with summer movie season. It's funny. The first thing is, every, I think every single movie you mentioned, I literally could picture the movie theater I saw it in. Yeah. And the, sometimes the line I was in, like I, I remember waiting in line to see Independence Day in Westwood. Oh, I yeah. remember 
waiting in line in Concord to see Total Recall. I remember waiting, you know what I mean? Like I can picture going into that movie theater and having that experience. Um, Terminator 2 being another one, like that was a huge one. I oh, mean, yeah. Terminator 2, because I was oh, such, yeah. I had watched Terminator, the original Terminator, 20, 30, 40, 50. I have no idea how many times. I watched yeah. it over and over again. So by the time that sequel is coming out, that was absolutely huge. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, and, and I remember going to see it. I remember just being absolutely blown away by it. Like that, that I think in a weird way, I think it's those movies that locked us in yeah. to be the generation that is now making the summer movies of today. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I think, I think studios saw consistently the amount of money they were making from the movies that were coming out during summer. And like you said, it started to become something that they bought into now even more so than in the 1980s. I think there's a much more, how can I say this? There's a much more eclectic group of films, like a much more variety in the 1980s. When you go to summer movies in the 1990s, the tastes are changing. The spectacles are getting bigger. World ending stuff is the topic. Uh, uh, of some of the movies, the idea of changing, the idea of sci-fi become the Matrix becomes a huge deal in 1999. There's all these changes that are happening. You know, from ter from Terminator 2 to Matrix, Steve, it's a heck of an arc in terms of the movies and the yeah. spectacle and the exploration and the stories that are being told here as well. You know, we survived the Cold War. The fall of Russia was what 91, 92 when the wall came down. Uh, or 93, I can't remember. Yeah, it was Bush was still in office. So 91, maybe 90 when the wall came down. And so now there's this whole new uh, thing to be afraid of, which is AI, which is, uh, you know, it, it, that could end the world. Uh, all that becomes a thing that we actually consider. And that becomes that got the focus of a lot of these summer movies over the next few years. You know, I, I mean, I definitely think you can see sort of where the culture is involved, yeah. you know, like in the in like with Raiders and sort of the nostalgia for the classic adventure that starts in with star Wars and then through the early eighties. Yeah. And then the more of the fear with things like Terminator and Jurassic park, which are fears right. of science going out of control. Um, I also think what's, what's really interesting to me, is just looking at these lists and watching the slow shift mm. to a very wide variety of topics and yeah. kinds of films to narrower and narrower and it, the first shift i think is the sort of oh we can get this big blockbuster that's one to release our big action movie that's going to get a wide audience and yeah. so you see but it's also you know movies like total recall or or matrix or um where where they are interesting ideas as yeah. well yeah. and then you know i, I don't want to jump ahead but i know we're going to get into the 2000s and that's where you see yeah. more and more of these movies have numbers at the end of them you know what yeah. i mean Yep. Like, and that's sort of the strange, the strange shift. And I, and I wonder too now, and Top Gun Maverick being an example is, are we going to see counter programming in the movie theaters at all? Or is it just going to be the big, big action sequel, part of a universe sort of movie, you know? I, yeah. And I think this is what we alluded to. And we'll talk about it later. Of course, the Top Gun Maverick, as I said earlier, might be the next evolution which combines, you know, as you said, a bit of a counter-programming story here with the elements of a, of, a, of a summer movie. So you've got the balance here that could be very fascinating to explore if there are other directors and writers who are able to understand how to create films like this going into the uh, 2020s and make money off of these films and get people into these theaters to watch them uh, and enjoy them for sure. So yeah, that's well, an excellent point. Well, it's like I was just looking like like taking ninety two as an example. Mm. You have you have Batman Returns, Lethal Weapon three. You have Patriot Games and Alien three. So those are all sort of what we expect yeah. as yeah. these are sequels to big properties. But also that summer you have A League of Their Own. You have Unforgiven, Far and Away, right. Death Becomes Her. Like these are these are movies that are not necessarily right in that summer movie a little more spot. adult yeah, yeah, yeah a little more adult and those are the things like i wonder if we can you know like i think far and away is tom cruise movie like that is that you know like that is a top gun not that it's like top gun maverick i don't mean that but it's a more <laughs> it's a more grown-up kind of movie right not that right. i like far and away i don't know why i'm bringing up that one as the as the example it's not a great movie but tom has always gravitated to those kinds of films though i mean you know for his He's had the Top Gun at the beginning, but more often than not, Tom doesn't gravitate to the empty-headed 
uh, fun action type thing. Even the no. Mission Impossible movies are quite intelligent when you break down the plots. Do they all kind of connect? Does, does every point connect up and seem possible? No, that's the fun flight of fantasy in those movies. But overall, you can tell that a lot of thought went into the plot of these movies and how extensive they are in terms of um, the different uh, situations that are happening in the movie and how much needs to go right for them to escape this particular mission. So that's Tom's always been a little bit of a sneaky, good barometer. Even the firm, you know, these are these films that came out in the 1990s. Tom has always gravitated to these deeper themes in movies, even though he's tried to be a movie star. His movies have had more weight to them, more heft to them than people might give credit for over the years. I never occurred to me before, but you are 100% right. I never thought of it. Top, Tom Cruise, in general, does not do frivolous action movies. No, that's not his thing. Like Mission Impossible, they're big, huge, ridiculous action movies, but they're all serious. Yes. The whole, they are like, we are in serious emotional distress to go try to make these things happen. It's not like, fun whimsical joke cracking kind of act that's not what tom cruise does he's yeah. interested in serious films even when they are spectacular action films exactly that's his gift uh jmb said it feels like we're headed for more toward we're headed more towards streaming and theaters are in a precarious position you guys think summer movies will become premium events with bigger seats food served in theater etc um steve you want to answer this one first i'll defer to you you've talked about this a lot um and i and and even when i resisted your opinions they've almost all turned out to be right so <laughs> i will i will defer to mr roca on this one listen one of the blessings and one of the curses is knowing people of of me for whatever reason i know people uh, both good and bad and i'm not always right but i can sense sometimes when things are changing now that being said and steve's very kind to to give me some credit for my opinions here but this is where I thought we were going, that we were going to turn movies into a premier thing, charge higher tickets so you get the most optimal experience. I mean, if you haven't seen a film in Dolby Atmos yet, do yourself a fucking favor. Go see a film in Dolby Atmos. It's incredible. IMAX is stellar. Dolby Atmos is just as stellar. Or even 40X where the chair is moving around. These are premium experiences that you're getting. And to be honest with you, for $20 to $25, you're getting them for cheap. They could sell you fifty to seventy-five dollars, all because you're getting a full-body experience when you're watching a movie. So go and enjoy them now before the numbers go up. That being said, Steve, it's funny this question came up. I actually was reading an article two days ago how online sales are starting to drop dramatically, and in-person sales are increasing. People are going out to stores again in larger numbers, not just because COVID or they think COVID's gone. They're going in with their masks. They're going in on the skin because people want to feel things in their hands again. People want that community. People want that feeling of shopping. They want to return to normal. So we're I was, I was in that article is talking about how many of these businesses are starting to lay off people, or these online businesses are starting to lay off people. How many of these businesses that really boomed during COVID are now unable uh, or unable to have a surplus of supplies for the things that they were creating for people to have. So you're seeing this happening more and more. 13% is the increase and it's down 4%. So 13% in person, 4% decrease in the uh, online stuff. So that's a significant shift. So in my mind, as I see people run out to see Top Gun Maverick in large numbers, as I see people go out to see Jurassic World Dominion in large numbers, it's not that I think the event stuff isn't still going to happen. It's that I think people still want to go to the theater. They want to feel that communal experience. So I don't know necessarily that theaters are in a precarious position. And I didn't think I would say this, Steve. Netflix looks uh, is shaky right now. And I never thought we'd see Netflix looking shaky, laying off co laying off workers, getting into trouble, PR nightmares, these kind of people not watching in larger numbers aside from Stranger Things. This could be the change where people start to demand these films return to the theater organically. Studios listen, and these films now start going back out of streaming and back into the theater. People want that experience again. And I didn't think we were going to be uh, seeing that from people. And I might have misjudged the situation. I think we'll know in a year or two when we have a little more examples of, of what that change may look like. I think you were... 90% right. I, I really do. Like, I think 
But what I think has happened, here's a really weird analogy. You know, you know, if you're playing like a racing video game and I was never very good at these things and you, you, you suddenly <laughs> yeah. realize oh, I got to oh. turn right and you turn yes. right like a little too hard yes. and then you go, oh no, I've gone too hard. And then you overcompensate to the left and you're like, no, I've overcompensated. You keep, and you never quite get the middle exactly right. I'm terrible at those games. <laughs> me too. Me too. Always been awful. Um, that to me is a perfect metaphor for human behavior in general, which is a big thing happens like a pandemic. And yeah. we go, okay, everything in the house. And then you go, oh, this is great. I can do, I can have everything I want. I can have everything, all the movies I want. I have all my food delivered. I can have all my stuff delivered. And yeah. I never have to leave my little safe space. And this is perfect. This is just what I want. I got all my stuff. And then after a couple of months, you go, this isn't what I want. Yeah. Like even, yeah, I can get that movie. And even if I have a great 4K HDR TV and I got surround sound set up and it sounds great and I'm sitting alone by myself in my couch in the same place that I see everything else all the time. And I'm actually not as having, I want to go out. Right. I want to go out and do a thing. You know, yeah. I want to go out to the restaurant. I want to go to the store. I want to be out with people. And yeah. I think there is, even though, and you know me, I'm as homebody a person as you could possibly <laughs> imagine. I want to be mostly left the fuck alone. Just that's what I want. But there's something great about going to see a movie in a theater. Yeah. And part of what's great about it is that it forces you to pay attention yeah. in a way that you don't. You're not you messing know? around with your phone. You're not playing on your computer. You're not no. listening to other things. You're not answering calls. You know, you're, you're not were... pausing it and going and grabbing the snack and doing exactly. you, you. You are here to watch the movie with other people that are there to watch the movie. And I'll say something else, too, which is it's not that I don't love the great Dolby Atmos you know, super mm. fantastic projection in the recliner chair with the right. sack. You know, I like all oh, that's great. I love that. Some of my best movie theater experiences were not because of the great screen or the great sound or the mm. great environment. It was because, I mean, I've talked a lot about the UC theater in Berkeley, which was the, yeah. you know, showed the classic films and Kung Fu films. And I we were just describing to my son about the midnight Rocky horror screenings you know which every saturday night at the uc they showed rocky horror and a bunch of straggly looking off and on drugs or, or drunk people showing up in outfits with toast in one hand and squirt bottles in the other would go in and just have an insane time in this and the uc was not a nice theater you know it was yeah, an old yeah. beat up theater it was exactly what these and it was awesome yeah. that that group experience or going to see some classic film or i remember going to see a screening of big trouble in little china mm. with people that love that movie and it was in a crappy movie theater and it was fantastic yeah. and i cannot have that experience watching big trouble in little china by myself sitting in my recliner not that i won't enjoy that but that is not the same thing is that we need to actually we've overcompensated and we actually knew, need to be around people and have these other experiences yeah, and I think that's in the end. I know the PR nightmare that uh, Bob uh, Chapek is enduring with Disney oh, yeah. here, of his own making, by the way. Um, I think if people start to demand these films return to the theater in larger numbers and these online viewings and streaming numbers start going down, people like Bob Chapek all of a sudden don't become so uh, invulnerable in their positions because they don't need to have the guy who's really good at straight to home video be in charge of the company anymore and deal with the uh pr nightmares that he brings on as a side effect of him being in power so don't be surprised if there are, i mean we've already seen a number of changes at, at the top in a number of studios over the last few weeks don't be surprised if as the numbers start rolling in more and more because only they have the internal numbers of streaming you're going right. to start to see some changes and some changes in the executive orders uh sorry executive positions of these companies uh, for sure um james oh uh, what, what let's see is there another is there a stream lab here sorry about that justin toner says hi john and steve one of my fondest summer memories is my dad taking me to see terminator 2 after i begged him to take me since i was underage we had a great time happy father's day to steve and everyone else in the cinephiles fandom and patreon oh thanks Justin. thank you very much uh, i did not take my dad to see terminator no no <laughs> Do you remember, do you remember, like, I mean, you already said, actually, Empire Strikes Back, I think, of, like, yeah. the family lining up for the movie. Yeah, yeah. Like, one for me, I remember the whole family lining up for Superman, oh, for the original yeah. Superman, and oh, that nice. was just a big, once it was sort of past high school, Yeah, I didn't really go to see summer movies with my family, that I remember. Like, I don't right. have a strong memory of those. It was much more yeah. going out with my friends, you know? Yes, yeah. Yeah, certainly, uh, uh, um, the baseball movie, Field of Dreams. I remember seeing oh, yeah. that with people. Rocky Fours with my friends. 
Rocky three was with some friends. So it's just, you just got to have that kind of uh, communal thing where you all get together. Your parents drop you off. If you're under 15, if you're over 15, you know, you find your way there and whatever, or your friend picks you up, you know, and, and, and you go see these movies. Absolutely. So, um, and Jonathan Peck says, I want to give a shout out to underrated summer blockbuster movies like uh potc one uh what am i is it phantom what is it what is it i don't know what that is independence day shrek and talladega nights yes the legend of ricky bobby speaking of the last film that i have mentioned what do you think of comedies in summer blockbuster season great question here uh jonathan uh, steve thoughts on comedies in summer blockbuster situations well this was the weird the last time we did a similar show was on comedies of the 80s and we oh, discovered right. there was a thousand comedies that came out in the 80s that there was a ton and when i looked through again my list historically yeah is that it was every single year there were comedies mm -hmm. you know like in in 89 yes we had batman star trek fight and last crusade but we also had ghostbusters 2 honey i shrunk the kids uh yeah. we had uncle buck uh you know that's also when harry met sally it's that we always had that yeah and today comedies there's so few of them yeah there's so few and and to me that is as much as we want to go see, you have if, if you're driven by young people, yes, young people want to go see the big giant action movie or the Marvel movie or whatever. Yeah. We wanted to go see comedies, you know. All through the 80s, I was going to see comedies during the summer all yeah. the time, and that yeah. doesn't exist anymore, you know. No, I mean, I think the 2000s, early two, uh, the 2000s, 2010s, it was the last gasp of them for getting Sarah Marshall, a maid of honor, what happens in Vegas, sex in the city, you don't mess with the Zohan, get smart, pineapple express, tropic. Thunder, um, 51st Dates, Tommy Boy, Get Smart, those are around those films. But yeah, you're but it isn't just the summer movie seasons, comedies overall have kind of um taken a bit of a vacation for now. And I think it's because there's been such a backlash to people joking about the things that they used to joke out about casually in the past in these movies whether it's sexism or racism with some of the jokes at asian people's expenses some of the jokes that were there at uh, women's expenses uh, some of the uncomfortable situations as steve mentioned with revenge of the nerds and other comedies that you see like oh, okay maybe com comedians are changing or metamorphosizing how comedy is happening here and so there's much more socially conscious comedy that's out there in a way that hasn't been before there are a number of comedy films. They're just not straight comedy. Um, but, you know, Bros is coming, which is a, it just looks to be like a fun um, movie that deals with a romantic comedy that deals with uh, a guy, Billy Eichner, falling in love with another guy and what that means in the gay community. And it's all gay actors uh, and it's getting a big studio release. So it's just this maybe this signals a little bit of a change in the comedy landscape. And maybe comedies can start looking at summer as a place to come and try out what they're doing and what the, and how the genre is changing and see what's working for people. I mean, Bridesmaids, that was a great comedy, right? But sure. that's 2011, if you can believe that. So, yeah. So, so uh, I watched the trailer for Bros. Yeah. That looks so fucking... Not only does it look hilarious yes. to me, but having a bunch of gay friends... Yeah, it seems right on the money. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, it That's seems true. like a lot of conversations I've had with a lot of my friends about what that world is like. And it seems I I hope I really hope it's fantastic. I really yeah. I hope it's fantastic just because I want there to be more movies. I hope it's fantastic just because I love a great comedy. But yeah. I also hope it's fantastic because it's a way to show a whole bunch of America who doesn't understand this world a little bit into what this world's really like, you know, yeah. if it's a good movie, wouldn't that be amazing? You know, I know. Uh, and the other side of this too, when we're talking about comedies, what a lot of these blockbuster movies have done uh, over the last few years is comedies have kind of gone down in terms of the numbers. Steve mentioned our 1980s, uh, our last, uh, last month's live show about uh, comedies from the 1980s. There were so many in the 1980s, and the numbers have just dropped here into the 2000s and 2010s and 2020s. I think what you're seeing, though, is these summer blockbuster movies co-opt some of the comedies by having right. comedic elements be a really essential part of their movies, whether it's Fast and the Furious or something someone mentioned here, uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean or the Marvel movies. They all have a little bit of – even that terrible Joss Whedon Justice League movie tried – 
to manufacture some comedy amidst the darkness, you know, and this is what you see happening. Comedies have changed in a way that the elements have been picked off the bone. The meat has been picked off the bone and put onto another, um, another movie to uh, kind of still check that box, but not be a full comedy. I think, well, and I, it's funny, the, the movie, our upcoming movie, which has not yet been announced, mm. one could argue is <laughs> the beginning of the truly hybrid action comedy film. Oh, great point. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Excellent point. It, it, yeah. It, it's so interesting. I was just looking because you mentioned uh, Bridesmaid. Yeah, and yeah. That, so that's 2011, and that was one of the years I was looking at. Yeah. Le, le, and this is the thing I was talking about. Like I was saying, you know, in the 70s, you could have all kinds of movies released yeah. in the summer. These yeah. are the top 10 movies in 2011. Harry Potter, Deathly Hallows, part two. Oof, no one jokes. of the trans, yeah, one of the Transformers movie, Hangovers, part two, Pirates, one of the, I think it's three, Cars, two, Thor, Captain America, Kung Fu Panda, two, Rise of the Planets of the Ape, X Men First Class, and Bridesmaids. Hmm. Of, so the top 10 films, there's only one movie yeah. that is not part of some other property. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Shows you the power of franchising that's really happened over the last few years because studios see the money and yep. that's where they focus their stuff on, which is why these summer su summer movie season we're seeing slowly start to come back, Steve, here. I think uh, in this year, especially in 2022, this is a little bit of revving the motor. The motor is 100% turned on, but I think by 2023, 2024, we will be back to having these kind of standard summer movie seasons uh, for sure, as people as uh, studios start to feel like people are wanting to come back into these theaters and enjoy these movies, and and we shall see, we shall see. Um, let's see here. J and B donated and said, if you were to star in your own summer movie, if you guys were to star in your own respective summer movies, what kind of a movie would it be? Summer action, father son <laughs> drama, summer romance. Steve, is it? Is it both of us? Like no, I'm no, playing the father respect. and John is the son. Is that what we're, <laughs> is that what we're doing here? Huh? It, it, it's so. I, I, I'll give you my honest answer. Yeah. Um, which is, I have very little fantasy of me starring in a summer movie. Wow. Okay. But I could certainly talk about directing summer uh, movies. Great. You know. Go go that angle, man. Go that angle. Yeah, I would. I I would. I have a. Uh, what I think of as a intelligent sci-fi action movie with a twist. I've got the script. Yeah. I will not pitch the whole idea because Good. this one I I'm less nervous about Paramount. You know, coming into taking my Star Trek idea. But yeah, I want to direct that film. That's yeah. what I want to do for a summer movie. Fair enough. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I think it would have Ooh, to be. And I've got a good part for you. Oh, great! Yeah, thank you. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um. I think for me, it would have to be some kind of spy thriller, right? I mean, that would mm. be the thing for me. I mean, I love the Mission Impossible movies. Uh, and that would be what I, with, a, with an occasional joke, an occasional sly moment, you know? I mean, I think that would be my approach to it. Um, that would be fun to do. Or maybe I'm the coach of a team and it's a sports movie, sports Ooh. summer movie. That could be fun. We've never seen the United States win the World Cup. How about a summer movie about me coming in as a coach, coaching the United States to win the World Cup for the first time ever, full of humor, full of action, full of drama, full of sports stuff. And then in the end, a great uh, um, feel good story because we win the World Cup first time ever in American history against the mean Italians. Come on. So let, let's make let's, it. let's work on this a little bit. So are you going to have to put together your ragtime ragtag team? Yes. Yes. They bring me in because the last coach was like Jurgen Klinsmann was too out there with his tactics, pulling in we players that he only wanted to have because they were the most expensive players out there in the world. He thought bringing the, uh, uh, the superstars of the American players together would be the key to winning the title, but they don't do it because they're a bunch of self-involved divas and they don't work together as a team. So I come in, they pick me. I'm like yes. Lou Brown from major league. I don't know That's if I want I to coach pitching. the team. I, I got I got another. I got, I got some white walls journey. coming in here. <laughs> I'll get back I, to you. I'm trying to set a, set a, sell a pair of white walls. Yeah, exactly. That kind of thing. And so I, you know, they come to me and I used to be a coach way back when, a coach prodigy way back when. 
but you know, I went through some stuff and then I've, you know, kind of fallen on hard times. So I've slowly put my life back together, working a decent job, you know, coaching my uh, daughter's youth team or some shit like that. And then they, for some reason, they kind of, a friend of mine gets into a position of power there and asks me to come and coach the team. And I initially resist and resist. And it's my daughter who says to me, wouldn't it be something for you to win for the first time? And that what kind of motivates me is my daughter's love of me and love of the game, kind of like Hayden Panettiere and remember the Titans. And that's what kind of motivates me to be there. So my smart, my smart ass daughter is at camp with me, helping me pick out the great players. So it becomes a little more of a fun approach to things. And I can see soccer or football purists going insane about it, but I see a lot of Americans. If we win the world cup coming to see the movie, that's what, okay. So I have a lot of thoughts. I'm, 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 Got some. So what we're talking about here is okay. it is Hoosiers meets Major League meets Ted Lasso. That's yes, yes. With a it, Latino it, in the lead, with yes. a Latino in the lead. Okay, here's a thought which I think is completely not doable, but I'm gonna throw it out there, and, and you probably should reject it. Okay. Is there any way that your daughter is such a fantastic prodigy that she could play on the team? No, no, because that's okay. going, that's a step too far. That's, that's, okay. that's what, what I thought. The, what was the one I was watching? The, the one with Amanda Bynes. I was watching that the other day. That's a step too far. Okay. Too far. Okay. What about this? So one of the characters should be the aging Ronaldo. So someone yes! who was an American aging guy. Yes. Yes. Um, that's great. And then you also need like the up and coming has played on the more violent, you know, like we're well, going to yeah. say the Charlie Sheenish guy yeah. who never has played at a high level, but has all the skills, but is undisciplined. Right. You got to bring in that guy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think, is there a strategy? Is there a way of playing that is going to unify this team? Like a, yes. something you could bring together. It's listen, everybody hates America anyway, in the world of football, like they hate America. Uh, because we're so good at everything else, it's the one place they've been able to own is football. So, which is soccer for you, Americans. So, <laughs> what if that's something we take advantage of and play uh, what Jurgen Klopp plays in Liverpool, Liverpool, which is heavy metal football, mm. uh, pressing from the back on, on the defenders there, uh, sending multiple uh, um, attackers forward. Building out from the back with the with the uh, uh, left back and the right back on the wings coming out and arming the offense or or initiating the offense, so it becomes more of an attractive, fluid offensive style of football, um, and and with multiple crosses into uh, into the box to get the ball there in a position to score goals. And so I think that would be something that's so different because the United States has always had the identity of being the plucky up and comers who can defend really well and just need that, that moment of that break, the counterattacking break to score the goal and win. That's always been our reputation. We've never been the aggressive fluid, you quote unquote European style of football. Uh, uh, we've never used those tactics. So I would come in as a Latino and having known those and try to implement those tactics and teach them. And of course there's resistance, there's anger, there's frustration. We lose the first few games so against smaller competition, so there's a real question of whether I can do it or not. And then something clicks, and it's the veteran combined with the hothead combined with the guy, the Charlie Sheen character, who figure out, like, yes, this can actually work, and they got to put their shit away, figure out how to work together internally in the team, and that's what turns the character around, turns the team around, and uh, gets us into a position to possibly win the World Cup. So then what you also need is so you got to have the <laughs> I'm loving this. You got to have so you got to have like two defensive guys who are really good. They're like the they're the backbone of the team. Yeah, and they have always been the never like the 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 superstars, but yeah. they are always consistent. Oh, they show up they do their job and they have to be completely against everything that you're trying to do. Yes. Right. And so that you have to challenge because their guys like, no, this is what we do. This is how we do it. We're good at it. Yeah. We've done it for you. And you have to go, no, no, you have to break them apart. You have to force them into doing something. And then in the course of the movie, yeah. in the middle of end of act two, they finally accept your style of play. And that's where you turn things around and start to win. Yeah. And that's the qualifying for, 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 for my snotty English friend, Darren here, who thinks I'm talking about the World Cup only, 
I'd have to have the qualifying. They wouldn't, they wouldn't hand me the job of coaching the team on the eve of qualifying for the world cup. I'd have to go through the elimination through the qualifying stages. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about, I'd lose the first couple of games, the first three games where there's questions of whether my tactics are going to work or not. And all the pundits are tearing me apart saying it's not going to work. And then boom, we turn it around in the middle of the hexagonal qualifying of the CONCACAF uh, uh, region. And that's how we kind of get into a position where we get in there. So I'm not saying we lose the first few games of the world cup. I'm saying we lose, lose the first few games in qualifying and then get, into a better position down the road. And maybe we do lose the first game of the World Cup and we're all sitting there and I'm and I'm like to Gene Hackman and Hoosiers, maybe they were right about us. Maybe we don't belong here. Maybe we're yeah. not blah, blah, blah. And it becomes that whole thing. And so they all have separate scenes where the most influential people in their lives, kind of like Miracle, you could weave in Miracle in this, have conversations with them to get them to believe in the possibility that they could win. So, well, yeah. I, think you, I think you totally lose the first game of the World, World Cup and because they, you're on the big stage right. and everyone yes. and they nervous. forget all the lessons that yes. you've taught and they're not playing their game. Right. And then you have have I ever told you, by the way, my uh, my ping pong story with my dad. <laughs> This, this only tangentially relates, but so yeah, we got uh, to get back to some of the movies here. We're, okay, we're, okay. We're, 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 poor Bill, poor All Bill right. is mad at us. He said, Enough already, sounds terrible. Like, All either right. way, so Bill, look at that black heart of yours and look at a puppy or something. Help All right. yourself I'll save that. the ping pong story for another time. <laughs> there, there, there'll come a time. Let's talk about summer movies. Yeah, okay, let's talk about summer movies. Let's move back to um, the, the, the 2000s here. Let's roll through these real quick and then we'll jump into the future. So here are some summer movies from the 2000s that we can take a look at. The Dark Knight, obviously, Spider-Man 1 and 2, Finding Nemo. Uh, as you mentioned, The Transformers, Moulin Rouge, an interesting one mm. as well. Star Trek came out in the summer, the, uh, the reinvention there in 2009. X-Men and X2, the Harry Potter movies, Wall-E, um, scary movie, and uh, you know a pun, a nice uh, satire film or spoof film. The Born, I Born Identity, launching a franchise and launching Matt Damon into being a real superstar. Ratatouille, District 9, The Da Vinci Code, and Signs. Uh, and another Tom Cruise one, War of the Worlds. So that's a great group of uh, summer movies there in the early 2000s. Yeah, I think this is where I think things definitely uh, turn. And yeah. it's and it starts with Spider Man and X Men. Those are the, that's the beginning of the modern comic book era. Good point. Yeah. Um, there, but there are a lot of there are a lot of good ones in there, like yeah. like Dark Knight. To get, you know what it's where I think it really works is where we're seeing interesting new interpretations of things, like Dark Knight, the reboot of Star Trek, which I love, although I don't love the other ones as much. Yeah. Um, I think, and it also gets locked. You know what's what's weird though is that because it, it becomes more predictable. Is Ooh. there's this certain point of like here comes the summer movies, what are and because it takes a couple of years for a movie, things are on like a two three year cycle in terms yeah. of and now will be the next Transformers movie, right. and a couple of years later, and now will be you know back in the day the Harry Potter movies, or now will be the next of the Batman movies, or now will be the next of you know one of these other Marvel movies. Like it just is like oh we're cycling through all of them. Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. And as we move into the 2010s, let's take a look at these here uh, uh, so we can, for expedience sakes, The Avengers is a summer movie, uh, Mad Max Fury Road, uh, Wonder Woman, Guardians of the Galaxy, both Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, The Conjuring, uh, Edge of Tomorrow, the last two Planet of the Apes movies, Toy Story 3, Inception. That's an interesting one to be a summer movie. Uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, X-Men Days of Future Past, Captain America Civil War, Man of Steel, John Wick 3, uh, Jurassic World, the Mission Impossible films, uh, Ted, which is a, a rare comedy there in the summer movie season over the last few years, and Incredibles 2 and Despicable Me. So a nice combination of animated, live action, multiple genres here, but also movies, Steve, that I would argue with a little more heft a little more weight to them, a little more of adults approach to the subject matter that they're covering. Even if they're comic book movies, there's still a little more weight to them than you might anticipate when it comes to summer blockbuster movies. I don't know. I don't know. This is where I start to, I, start, it's, I don't have anything against these movies. And there are a lot of those that I really, really like. I really, really like, you know, uh, Captain America Civil War, or I like yeah. it. I really, really like Spider-Man Homecoming. The Despicable Me movies are fun. They're fun. But, but there's a certain point where it's like, you know, I'm looking at Cars 3 and I'm looking at, 
you know, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 and Wonder and it's just it's just the lack of variety. It's it's yeah. you know, like in this list like in 17, okay, there's Dunkirk and then everything else is a sequel, you know. In in 2018, yeah. I it's Incredibles 2, Jurassic Park 2, Infinity War, Deadpool 2, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Solo, Mission Impossible, Fallout, Transylvania 3 and Ocean's 8. Right. It's like everything has a number. You know, and it's not that I don't think some of those are good movie. And yes, uh, uh, Infinity War definitely has some heft yeah, for a yeah. Marvel film. Yeah. But that's all there is, you yeah. know, like that's that's where I start to get troubled. I see. And I don't get as troubled because I like that they're weaving the more adult themes like Mad Max Fury Road. I mean, that's a dude who is stealing women to turn them into his harem in a cult. Right. And Mad Max has to stop this with Imperator Furiosa helping. Well, not helping. Leading the charge to stop this from happening and defending and, and the other women who she's taken there to save them from that future. And wonder woman is going back to world war one and exploring the idea of hatred in the world, the idea of wanting to use force and um, power and arms to subjugate an entire world. This is something that's still we hear in the rumblings in our actual social political climate nowadays that there is a certain section of people who want to do that, who want to use their weapons to subjugate people who would dare to speak differently or look differently or dare to be a member of the LGBTQ plus community or person of color. We see that Guardians of the Galaxy. It's about, you know, people from completely five different walks of life coming together somehow and becoming a family. You know, I think there are deeper uh, meanings going. Edge of Tomorrow is a fantastic film that explores that with uh, Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt as well. You know, this idea of, well, you can't just sit on the sidelines. Apathy is not the way to go. Cowardly dipping out of the battle that is the that is that could save the world is actually not the way to go. So I think there's more going on in there. I mean, Planet of the Apes is all about the apocalypse. Yeah, of that one is losing power in our society to a stronger force and how we would react to that. You know, I, uh, you're never going to hear me bad mouth Mad Max Fury War Road. I think yeah. it's a great movie. I don't think it's a deep movie. I mean, the fact that we're we, we're dealing with, you know, <laughs> OK, no, I don't think it's deep. I don't okay. think it's a deep. I, I mean, like, it, is it dealing with a heavy, serious thing? I mean, yeah, John Wick is dealing with heavy, violent, serious things, but it ain't deep. No, you Wick, know what Wick I mean? I think Mad Max Fury Road is deep. I don't think Wick is deep, but that's all right. But, you know, I mean, I listen, I can't wait till whatever the 10th anniversary of Mad Max Fury Road is so we can dig into that movie. That is a that is a lot of a movie. But when you have <laughs> a dude with a flame throwing electric guitar strapped to a, a vehicle, hey, that man. ain't deep. I don't know Come what on. the fuck it is. Come on. <laughs> but deep. I mean, it's like Gallipoli as a summer movie. That is a deep movie. You know? <laughs> It's like boring. That's a boring movie. But yes, what? I hear what you're saying. How oh, dare God. you, sir? I can't guess. One of the oh. rare Steve McQueens I do not like is Gallipoli. So, but yes. Steve McQueen? No, the Gallipoli oh, Peter Weir. What? What'd you say? Which one? Gallipoli. Oh, Gallipoli. I'm sorry. I was thinking the one with Steve McQueen and uh, Dustin Hoffman. Oh, oh so that's um uh oh. Papillon. Yeah, Papillon. Sorry about that. No, I like yeah. Gallipoli. Gallipoli is yeah. great. Oh my we're, god, we're in a hundred percent agreement. Yes. That ending <laughs> like, is Papillon, hard. Boring. <laughs> um, Gallipoli. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean it's like, uh, and and again, I don't have. I'm not saying that some of these summer movies aren't dealing with slightly more serious things. I mean, Dark Knight is dealing with more serious things than other comic book movies. Yeah, but that doesn't make it Gandhi. Well, well, you know if that's I mean? your barometer. I think a lot of movies are not going to measure up in terms of deepness to something like Gandhi. And by the way, I've been, I mean, I know we're talking about, you know, we're, we're on live right now. I think we need to put, we need to fast track Gandhi maybe after our next yeah. film, because sure. Ms. Marvel is dealing with the partition that hmm. happens after Gandhi does what he does in the movie. So I would like to explore that movie. Now it seems timely uh, so just a suggestion and we might No, we've we might talked about it for it. years. We I have. think we put it on the schedule a couple of times and never yeah. gotten to it. I'm all for it. I haven't watched it in 15 years. Oh my god, it's in 14. Yeah. Years. I got to get it. I, I know it is and I know it's one of your absolute favorites it and is. Gandhi is one of my absolute heroes. Yeah. And you would be forcing me, which is awesome, to do research on 
Mahatma Gandhi, which would be great for me. So I would love to do it, and right. I think we should. Look out for the look out for that announcement coming soon, ladies and gentlemen, for sure. Um, all right, well, Steve, let's turn to. Well, I haven't seen any stream. Oh, sorry, we've gotten some stream labs. Let me get to all of them, and then we'll move into our final section here. Sure. Mackenzie said, "In honor of Father's Day, what is your go-to father-son film?" Ah, man, for Steve, what is your go-to movie you share with your son? All right. Okay. Um, father-son movies. I mean, certainly, there's like Field of Dreams is you know the classic. Is that your go-to? He's asking for your go-to. So not a list. One. What is your go-to father-son rule? For me personally, Field yeah. of Dreams is probably my go-to. Okay. I'm trying to think of... See, uh, it's tough thinking about father-son with my son. Okay. Because when I think of a father-son movie, it's something that is going to make me cry at the right. end. Right. My son will not watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> he has no interest what he wants to share with me are things that involve being gross and violent and right. insane and ridiculous not heartfelt and moving that is mm -hmm. not his thing fair enough um how about you big fish that's oh the sure Great because one. that's my dad and so for me that's the movie i mean that's the movie all these fantastical stories of his life uh how much of them i believed and that were true or weren't true I don't know, but like it's, he's always, he always had stories. So to me, that's the connective tissue before that it was absolutely field of dreams until I saw big fish. And that's more, uh, connectable to me, uh, for sure. So that's, that's my answer. Um, let me see here. Brian, Bra Brian Brawlers. It sounds like the movie you're pitching is Ted Lasso meets the way back. Oh, I haven't seen the way. Oh, I don't oh, know the way right. the Ben Affleck film. Yeah. Oh, that's a good film, by the way. That's a great comparison. Thank you, uh, Brian, for that. Um, I may have to work on this. JMB says, "I don't know if I want. I don't know if I want to coach the U.S. men's national team. I got a new podcast with the Lady Outlaw. She's making me watch Dirty Dancing. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, we're kicking around an idea of doing a new kind of stereo show called um, uh, I Told You So, and it's her making me watch films I've never watched before." which includes Dirty Dancing, Labyrinth, The NeverEnding Story, all these films that she loved, but I've never seen. So we might, that's something we're kicking around. So good, good, good luck with some of those. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm worried about. Um, John, the Dirty Dancing is good. Dirty Dancing's good. Yeah, is it? Okay. Pirates yeah. of the Caribbean 1, that's what I was talking about. So that's oh, right. Yeah. Jonathan Beck is getting at. Um, oh, and the let's see, Secular Monk says drive in theaters were much more abundant 25 years ago than they are today. Do you have any memories of watching summer blockbusters at the drive-in? I didn't have drive-ins in Virginia. So, Steve, do you have? did you go see any in, in California? Yeah, there was one in San Rafael. And I, I'm trying to remember. I, re, I definitely remember going to see Benji in the drive-in oh, theater. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I know I saw other stuff there, but I can't quite think of what. I mean, it, it was definitely more for sort of Disney-ish movies was what okay. we saw the drive-in. Drive right. But no, I don't remember specifically. Okay. Uh, let me see if we've got any stream labs. Uh, Doug Developer says, hello again. Growing up, did you guys ever hesitate going to the theater by yourself? Until we got into college, we would never be caught dead in the theaters alone, especially in the summer because it looks like you have no friends. Oof, Doug, you are so caught up, my brother, in, in perception of other from other people. Um, I never hesitated going to the theater by myself. In fact, I prefer to go to the theater by myself. Don't get me wrong. I love going in mass with my group of friends. But one of the joys in my life now is going to screenings with only 10 people in the theater in San Diego. In California, it was never that way because you see all your buddies, all your friends with different channels. But in San Diego, there's not that big of a film community. So now I essentially am going to see these movies by myself. And I get to relax and enjoy it, not worry if the other person next to me is enjoying it or not. Um, and even before then, I used to go see movies by myself because... I'm an empathetic person, and so the next person next to me, if they're not liking the movie, it's going to taint my enjoyment of the film. So usually, if it's not a date or I'm not hanging with my brother, my friends and my brothers, I'd rather go by myself to a movie, and I've never had an issue with that. As soon as I had transportation, which might have been just my bike, <laughs> and as soon as I had money in my pocket, I went yeah. to see movies by myself. Yeah. I mean, part of it, I didn't have all that many friends like in early times yeah, in high school, fair enough, fair enough. you know, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, once I was able to use my mom's Toyota Corolla station wagon <laughs> to run out and go see a movie, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Fair point. 
Um, yeah. All right. So those are all the, the stream labs and the super chats, Steve, these are the summer movies coming out this year. Have you taken a look at any of these at all? I can throw them out to you and see if any of them, uh, and, and pick, picking up from, oops, sorry about that. Picking up from, uh, the date right now, that would be light year just came out. The push comes spearhead. Um, oh, Elvis is coming out next week. Any interest in that? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You've seen it, right? I did. I did. And I am going to see it four or five times. I'm telling you I, this right now. From what I've seen, it looks good. From what I've heard, <laughs> it looks good. I saw the, um, there was like a uh, screen test with him singing. Yes. That I saw. And I was like, oh, damn. Yeah. So, yeah, super excited about all this. His singing is incredible for sure. Uh, the Black Phone, any interest in that horror film? Nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't, even, I didn't even look at the trailer. So <laughs> I saw that one too. It's good. It's a chilling Ethan Hawk for sure. Okay. Thor Love and Thunder. That comes out July 8th. Absolutely. Okay. I, I mean, like everyone else, I, you know, Taika Waititi back to Thor, all into it. The yeah. Gray Man, which is the Russo Brothers one. I, so he, I have mixed feelings. So I like the Russo Brothers. Yes. I think Ryan Gosling is a fine actor. I love Chris Evans. Yeah. Watching the trailer, I was like, this is the, I'm sure the action sequences are great. Mm. I didn't feel drawn in by the trailer. I don't know how you feel okay. about it. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, mainly because I, what you talked about, seeing the explosions and the big stuff. So I want to see what this is all about, you know, and um, the Russo brothers have kind of a spotty record, you know, uh, producing uh, outside of the Marvel uh, sphere, right? Because Cherry wasn't that good. But I liked Extraction. Um, I didn't like Twenty One Bridges, but this one looks interesting. So I don't know. It's a, and you know I, I'm just kind of reserving judgment till I see it. That mustache. I don't know if I like it on Chris Evans. To be honest, <laughs> the mustache is a choice. Yeah. Like that is the thing. <laughs> um, and we've got two uh, novels here. Persuasion is coming out on July 15th, and Where the Crawdads Sing is also coming out on July 15th. So persuasion, that's the Jane Austen, right? Yes, the one with Dakota so, Johnson. Yeah. So my memory is that that is my favorite Jane Austen book. Oh wow. Okay. Um, so I I you know, I love a good Jane Austen. So I, I really hope it's good. It's a really good story. The you know, sh she's one of the great writers of all time. So I hope yeah. it's good. Nope. The um Jordan Peele. I was watching I watched the trailer again this morning. Mm. And I was, and it's so interesting with that trailer because at first I was like, going, okay, yeah, what's this? And about halfway through the trailer, I go, man, this could be a really interesting movie. Yes. So or I, I hope it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Or it could be horrible. <laughs> we don't know. It's because it's, it's way out there. So yeah. who knows if it's going to work? I guess we'll find out. Bullet Train, August 5th. Any interest in that? Also based on a book, by the way. So, okay. Uh, I have not read that particular book. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I like Brad Pitt. There's lots of it, it, it. That's one where if the tone works, yeah, it could be a lot of fun. Okay, but but I don't know. What what's your feeling about it? I'm I, I think it's going to be terrible or great. It's one of those. Yeah, it's going to be terrible yeah. or great. Uh, I like that it's Japanese influenced. I saw the first 15 minutes at CinemaCon, and I don't not want to see it. So that's a win. <laughs> So I'm going to see what the rest of the movie is like. So I, but I liked what I saw, but I could see if the movie goes any further, um, having issues with it down the road. Yeah. But we shall see. Um, let's see. Beast is another one here with Idris Elba taking on a bloodthirsty lion with Shalto Copley. Oh, I haven't, I've have not watched the trailer for that one. So okay. I have no opinion. Okay. Uh, bet uh, me time with, uh, Mark Wahlberg and Kevin Hart playing former best friends who decide to have their first guys now night out in years oh, yes. and rowdy stuff happens. Yeah. I don't have a lot of faith in that one. <laughs> How about 3000 years of longing, which is uh, Mad Max for your, your, your favorite director, George Miller here coming back with a magical tale of Tilda Swinton. who's a lonely scholar while on vacation in Istanbul meets Istanbul meets a genie Idris Elba that is willing to give her three wishes in exchange for his freedom the only problem is she can't think of a single thing to wish for Ooh. i uh, i watched the trailer <laughs> yes i think if it's good it's going to be amazing that's yes. my feeling but i really like the trailer a yeah. lot obviously i do love george miller i think he is a, a mad genius and <laughs> i i i really hope it's great I, it's yeah. you know it's funny we were talking about 
I taught said over and over again how I wanted to see more variety this yeah. summer. There's yeah. a lot of variety. There is. And so, you know, between Elvis and this George Miller film and, yeah. you know, we're all over the place. And, and I, this one in particular, I, I have high hopes for, how, how do you feel about it? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm hoping so too. I, I think I'm cheering for all the films that are a little more adult oriented. And I can't wait to finally get back in the rhythm of seeing these films because the pressure comes with me. I've got to review it. So I, I got to kind of disconnect those things in my head so that I can watch movies. And if I feel like reviewing it, I'm doing, if not, I don't have to. So, but I, I'm looking forward to seeing more adult fare combined with Thor and Love and Thunder, combined with these right. other superhero films. So if you're not bullet train, so we have a nice balance uh, and kind of maybe resume going back, resume going back to what the summer movies, the best of the summer movie decades were all about, which was good variety and interesting projects that challenged you as a viewer. So excited you and entertained you, but also challenged you uh, as well. And more of the adult fare and also Samaritan, which I don't know if it's going to be good or not with Sylvester Stallone as an aging superhero. So there's a piece of me that okay. really hopes that's good, man. So, so here's what's weird. Cause you know, I tried to prepare. I look, I saw that was coming out. I looked for a trailer. I couldn't find the right trailer for this movie. Is it <laughs> like something that was supposed to come out a couple of years ago or? Y yes. Yes. Um, there has been a YouTube video of, tra of Samaritan. There's actually a trailer for another Stallone film. Yes. So there's no, there's no official thing out yet. So it's very weird in their approach to things uh for sure so that youtube that was the one i started watching i'm like okay why is this called samaritan and i think matthew modine was in it and i was yes. like well, well this looks weird and then halfway through i'm like this is not for this movie, so i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> but i would say if you this say like listen <laughs> this is, this is not my, my office wife? Um, you say like, hey, there's this Sylvester Stallone movie yeah. that's supposed to come out soon, but they haven't released a trailer and it was supposed <laughs> to come out a couple of years ago. What are the odds it's good? <laughs> I don't think our odds are that great. Yeah, you're not wrong. The, the Tulsa King looks good, though, which is the new series coming to Paramount Plus, mm. uh, which uh, which is a mafia based thing where he's sent to Tulsa much to his chagrin. Uh, mm. to figure out things in Tulsa. So, um, all right. One last thing we should talk about, Steve, as we wrap up future of summer movies. I mean, we've kind of alluded to, we had some questions early on in the show. Where do you see summer movie season or the summer movie blockbuster going here over the next few years? What do you anticipate? Especially as you look at the slate here for 2022, what do you anticipate going forward that we're going to be getting? You know what? I think this is, you know, having looked at this slate and after our conversation, mm. it feels like this is a real test year. Oh, and if, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like if 3000 years of longing and uh, and bullet train and pray is just another way to talk, you know, like if those do really well, well, then maybe maybe it'll change. And if mm -hmm. and if all of the movies that are unusual, that aren't part of larger properties tank. Yeah, we're going to go right back to Marvel movies and sequels and, you know, IP from other places reused over and over again. That's what I think. Yeah, we're seeing Lightyear underperforming. It's looking at fifty-one million dollars for opening weekend, which is really bad for a um, Pixar movie. Pixar, yeah, it's sad to see. Um, and but we've got an interesting combination of things coming up, as Steve mentioned, because Marcel the Shell is also coming out uh, next week with uh, Elvis and the Black Phone. That's Jenny Slate's little YouTube creation that has now got a feature film, and it's getting incredible reviews. So, what if that does really well? You know that. What do you what do you think about that? Where the crawdads sing? If that was I'm seeing a screening of this week. If that comes out and does really well, how are we adjusting our mindset? You know, are we starting to open the door to more adult fare? Just satisfying adult moviegoers. Are they clamoring? Are they going to show up for these movies and put them over the top? Which I think will change the perception or the uh, the uh, summer movie season overall um in a good way because i love the right. superhero movies but i like to have the nice counter programming to go into a theater and experience these adult movies or more mature movies with other people in the theater as well enjoying and understanding the journey and reacting to the things that we're getting and giving us things to think about as human beings i mean the greatest films are the ones that make us question our human condition and they do they have existed for decades in the summer movie season kind of taking a little bit of a break over the last few years so maybe this is as you said steve a bit of a change here um and a test case to see if maybe this is what people want to see going forward in the future and i hope it is you know well i mean we have been through a radical change yes. in our lives in the last two years yeah, yeah and so maybe coming with that there'll be an opportunity for some changes in taste yeah 
and maybe people will go out and have an amazing communal experience on a movie that's unexpected and then things will change and that would be awesome i agree i agree well there you go that's our cinephiles live episode for this month thank you all so much for joining us here live on the channel thanks for your stream labs thanks for your super chats thanks for being a lively bunch of people in the chat whether you're positive or negative with your comments, we appreciate you leaving them. Uh, I try to block as many of those uh, people who are coming in with their uh, nefarious stuff as I could. So hopefully I didn't, it didn't ruin y'all's experience. Steve, another fun show. Any final words here? And uh, where can they find you? And where can they find us uh, as the Cinephiles? Well, they can find uh, the Cinephiles on all your podcast sources. You can find me at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. You can support the show at patreon.com slash the Cinephiles, which is right up there. You can uh, buy every movie we've ever reviewed. Not this, not every movie, summer movie in the history of film, but on <laughs> cinephiles.net. Um, and you asked me one other question. I don't remember what it was. Oh, you can, uh, how about some Star Trek? You can have Enterprise incidents with Scott and Steve. There you go. And Shout out to our brother, Scott Mance. First article in Variety. So oh, shout yeah. out to him uh, talking about Strange New Worlds, of course. Um, as for me, you can find me at the Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The Outlaw Nation on Twitch. Going to be doing a lot more stuff on Twitch. And my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca Says. And my other podcasts, The Geek Buddies, and the top 10 show that are out there for you all to enjoy. Uh, we love you madly. You all take care of yourselves. Be well. And we'll talk to you next time with another brand new. Oh, and enjoy the summer movie season. Have here. a great summer. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And happy Father's Day to those there who are watching us currently live who are fathers and dead is. And we'll talk <laughs> to you next time with another brand new The Cinephiles Live episode. Take care until then.